welcome everyone for the Irina online seminar series. So we're excited to have Dr. Chloe Fujaris, and she'll be talking on direct cross-section measurement of the weak R process reaction in the neutrino winds of core collapse supernovae. So it will be a very exciting talk. And to introduce Dr. Tilo Fujiris's work, mainly focuses on experimental nuclear physics. And she studies in particular explosive stellar nucleosynthesis. Dr. Fujiris is currently a postdoctoral appointee at the Atlas facility in Argon National Lab in Chicago. And she completed her PhD in the French facility GANIL, where she graduated last year. Her research interests revolve around proton captures in novae and alpha in the winds of core collapse supernovae. She also works on nuclear experiments using detection systems such as the active target music and the gamma ray array agata. She's also interested in connecting the experimental reaction rates to the associated astronomical observables. Part of her work is dedicated on stellar modeling. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fujiris for this talk on the IRINA online seminar series. Dr. Fujiris, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, here and uh, online. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for this pleasant uh, invitation to share about uh, recent results, as mentioned, related to the recap process that may happen uh, in the neutrino driven waves of core collapse supernovae illustrated here. And uh, these results are um, some improvements on key reaction rates uh, in the weak air process that were obtained by direct cross-section measurements with the active target music. Uh, shown here, I will explain in a few moments more. First, I would like to uh, start um, yeah, start with a familiar picture, uh, the chemical elements surrounding us uh, and their abundance, as you may know, are uh, well known uh, for more than half a century now. Just a reminder here of the resulting uh, cosmic abundance of, as a function of the atomic number. And you can see the peak here uh, relevant for a nuclear uh, structure uh, behind uh, nuclear properties. We also know very well the uh, reaction mechanism to make these elements. So mainly uh, the fusion, so combination of two light path nuclei to have an heavy one, which bring you energy up to iron. Then you have the kind of reciprocal process after iron to gain energy by the spontaneous fusion of the heavy elements to have lighter ones. Also, some particle capture reaction like proton capture, alpha particle, neutron capture, the natural beta plus and minus radioactivity, and a part of a spallation reaction and direct react spallation processes and direct reaction in the cosmic rays. The main question nowadays are more when and where in our universe uh, these elements were made and by how much which we quantify with the reaction rate. I will talk more later. So coming back uh, to the elements, when we looked in these two dimensions, we will know as a function of the proton and the neutron, we know that for the hydrogen and helium isotopes at the start, they were mostly made during the primordial nucleosynthesis, uh, tens, hundred minutes after the Big Bang. And then as mentioned, up to iron, you produce elements through the quantum burning, through fusion reaction in the main sequence of star. And in you, with this um, well-known onion shape for massive star, with the light hydrogen shell, and at the core, the iron, mainly. Just want to mention that some elements, in particular in the proton rich side, are also made through proton and alpha uh, captures through explosive burnings in binary system you may have heard like uh, novae or extra bursts. After iron, we know the elements are mainly produced through the slow and rapid process, which are neutron capture reaction followed by the beta minus decay to bring you elements back to stability. And it was a key observation a few years ago with the strontium uh, line in the visible spectrum, the kilonova, shown here, after a neutron star emerging event, that the rapid process 
is indeed ongoing in such a stellar event, so the collapse of two neutron stars. We still have some open question for this rapid process. Is it also ongoing in what we call core collapse supernovae? I will explain what it is uh, in a few minutes. We also have observed abundances around the actinid region, dead equal 90, and before the silver first peak, around dead equal 40, that are not explained by the slow or rapid process, so we need additional mechanisms. And this, with this question, I will focus more on today's landscape, which is the weaker process. But going back to the start, I show you here uh, the abundances uh, observed, so the black squares, in a subset of star old, so low metallicity stars. And uh, these abundances are compared here with the model prediction from the rapid process, the red curve, and the slow process, the blue curve. At the bottom, you have the difference between observation and models, and you see that we have pretty good agreement. Except, around that equal 40, you clearly see that the observed abundances are enhanced compared to your model prediction. So between strontium and palladium. So we need an additional mechanism than rapid process or as process. What I call, what is has been called a weak air process, weak kind of truncated uh, air process. One possible side of this weak air process is inside after a core collapse supernovae event. So here we start with uh, the massive star at the end of life, I told you, we have, you have this kind of onion shell for the nuclear composition. And this is massive star, meaning tens of uh, sun, uh, solar mass uh, for this star. So here, the gravitational force is so that the radiative energy force gained by nuclear reaction is not enough to prevent the collapse of the star on its own weight. This the first step. You have, after it, a short rebound of the external chain, followed through temperature and pressure condition by the fast explosion that emits huge amount of light. And from Earth, we can see this well with uh, the supernova bright light in our uh, sky. And just a comment here, depending on the light is uh, atomic composition, we have uh, categorized this supernovae around different types, 1B, 1C, you may have heard about it. After the explosion, so the core, the remnant at the start, depending on the initial mass, maybe a neutron star or a black hole, black hole for the heavy one, and the external chain are ejected into the interstellar medium, mainly driven by the neutrino flux. And here, Anticipating a little, you can expect indeed that this hot ejecta being flowing into the interstellar medium will cool down and maybe enter into nuclear reaction pathway. Important parameters characterizing this ejecta we will talk about is the time scale uh, for this ejecta, its entropy, and the electron fraction here. So as mentioned, through the expansion of the ejecta, temperature are cooling down. I show you here for different uh, capture reactions, so neutron, proton, alpha, and the reciprocal time inverse reaction, the dotted curve, as a function, so the, the, the time scale uh, of the reaction as a function of temperature. So at the start of the ejecta, after the explosion, haute temperature, you can see that the both reaction and its inverse reaction are as quick, meaning, for instance, with neutron gamma reaction, you are as probable to capture a neutron, emit a gamma, or the inverse. So you don't really change your isotopic composition, and this is a well known equilibrium stage. Now, as you can see already here, by cooling down the temperature, you start to our reaction channel being faster than the reciprocal one, in particular, with at four and three gigacabin, the first one to ignite, the alpine reaction become out of equilibrium. And you can see here that by alpha capture then a neutron emission, you will produce a element. This is a weaker process. 
Now, this, most of this uh, alpha reaction, uh, we don't have experimental uh, data on the rate, so we rely on theoretical calculation. Here we are in the mass region around silver, our relatively high excitation energy in the compound nucleus, away from the particle uh, emission threshold. So we can use a statistical model based on the high level density, the well-known surface bar model. So here the idea simply the cross section for the alpha N reaction is given by the product of the alpha entrance channel on the seed nuclei, this um, alpha T, multiplied by the ratio of the neutral exit emission channel in the compound nucleus, normalized by the sum of all open exit channel in the compound nucleus, which can be also explained as this BN parameter. As mentioned, we are at high energy in the compound nucleus, so your BN parameter is almost one, and your conception is, on, is proportional mainly to the alpha and trans coefficient on the nuclei. And this is given by uh, optical model potential um, available. So now we have all the ingredients to determine the rate. I show you here an example with the stable rubidium 87, the alpha 1n and 2n reaction rates calculated with the standard calculus, normalized by the um, reference reaction database rate as a function of temperature, and also by including different optical model potential for the alpha capture on rubidium 87, and the different color line here. And you can already see that for our gamma window of interest, so on 3 giga Kelvin, depending on the alpha optical model potential shown, your reaction rates varies by more than one order of magnitude. Is it only the case for this nuclei? We play the game with another one, strontium 88, stable one, and you see some representation in the gamma of window. Your reaction rate and certainty due to the choice of the alpha optical model potential are up to 100 um, uncertainty. And also, in this, for this nuclei uh, concerned by the recap process, some are located at the neutron shell closure, n equals 50, and we know they, are, they may have some uh, difficulties uh, dealing with optical model potential here, or some surprise, or to say, for uh, this nuclei at the shell closure. This is the situation. So, okay, we are using this theoretical rate. We've, we know the uncertainties we have. And the next question is how it impacts when you try to predict the abundances. And this was well done recently uh, by uh, Tanasis and Wall. Uh, so the first step was to look with the red variation due to, as I showed you before, the uncertainty mainly from the nuclear optical model potential. You look then at the predicted abundances. An example here, clear, for the molybdenum or zirconium ratio, by varying the krypton 89 alpha reaction, you clearly see that um, you, you uh, propagate an uncertainty on the expected reaction rate, and you see by the uh, Spearman correlation coefficient that you are almost um, um, linearly correlated. So the rate uncertainty directly uh, will uh, translate into uh, the isotopic uh, uncertainties. Going further, with this approach, you can already quantify among all uh, the isotopic present which alpha uh, reaction impact the more your uh, uncertainties on the expected abundance ratio. Going further, so with the same idea, you looked, uh, they looked at the isotopic um, expected ratio for strontium and yttrium in this case, varying the rate, you can uh, get sort of close to Gaussian distribution, and you can extract this one to sigma that would quantify your, again, impact of the reaction rate variation on your isotopic ratio. Looking then uh, for this uh, similarly to uh, isotopic uh, abundance, you can see it. So one to sigma, the contour 
from the reaction rate variation. And you include another variation I mentioned at the beginning, which is the stellar condition of your neutrino driven wheel, mainly the electronic fraction, the entropy, and the time scale, these MC models. And here you can see also the black point corresponding to observed abundances. For sure, it would be good to have a more accurate uh, observed abundances for this all star, but clearly you see the overlap between the contour and the MC stellar condition in the wind. So we need on the nuclear side to be able to reduce strongly the uncertainties. So then by comparing observed to model abundances, you have a way to uh, gain insight on the stellar conditions. And so through these studies, uh, we can, uh, we have seen uh, the um, reaction that, as mentioned, impacts the most. So I remind you here, we are interested with the weaker process around the uh, just before silver region. So in the chart, mainly, the target nuclei have been identified here, mainly so through alpha capture in four kind of categories. So the main one, meaning the reaction uncertainties will impact a lot of uh, isotopic ratio under many astrophysical conditions, up to the impact with C4, or where this nuclei will only impact few element ratio under few astrophysical conditions. But this is a clear guideline for us experimentalists to go and try to measure this alpha uh, reaction on this C nuclei and uh, reduce the uncertainties. So this was done. So the way uh, done uh, I'm going to present today is through the use uh, to measure uh, this alpha, to determine this alpha and re reaction rate by using an active target. Uh, so as uh, the name uh, tell it, this is an approach where both your target for the reaction will be also your detection medium. With this approach, you clearly see that the, one of the key uh, assets is you are close to 100% efficiency. So when you want to measure astrophysical cross-section, uh, relatively low energy, so low cross-section, relatively itself to have such high efficiency. The assets with active targets is also, you will increase your target thickness, still maintaining a good resolution on the excitation portion of the total cross-section. Another asset in inverse kinematic, you can reach the upper uh, high astrophysical energy region, at least here for the weaker process. And also, it's um, kind of um, um, easy approach in the sense that, as mentioned, both your target is also the detection method. So to get the cross-section, you have already the measurement of the entrance beam, so it's self-normalizing. Uh, and you can measure from a single uh, beam energy uh, the UR excitation function at different points. So with this um, asset, so the, the result I will present today we were obtained with uh, the active target music shown here, which is an ionization sh uh, chamber uh, at Atlas and also uh, experiment at Defrib. So the idea, just an illustration with the strontium uh, case, you have your high uh, beam, I'm reminded, we are in inverse kinematic, that will go through uh, your gaseous detector. You will uh, lose energy and also you know, ionize the gas because you have imposed an electric field with, uh, at the bottom part, the cathode on negative ions. You have a field, so the electron will drift towards the anode and the ion, helium in this case, you want to measure alpha capture, helium gas, will drift to uh, the cathode. Now, because the anode, as you can see, is electric segmented, you can tag uh, the alpha reaction at different energies. This is why I mentioned at the beginning from single beam energy, you can measure your excitation function at different energy while your beam is slowing down. And just a comment for Fuser, and with this detector, as you can see, downstream, so in this part after the beam, we have the possibility to put a silicon detector at zero degree that was used to measure online the beam energy loss in our gas windows towards the gas and in the gas area. Okay, and just a short comment, because as mentioned, 
we want uh, to, with this approach, the statistic is important. We want to measure relatively low cross section. So we want to uh, include, accept uh, high intensity uh, beams. So it was a recent transition for this detector to our digital electronics that allow higher rates. And the result I will present today, uh, the, one of them is the first experiment with this acquisition. So just as mentioned, the anode is segmented. Uh, uh, in total, you have uh, usually the music this 36 channels, so dividing in this kind of four digitizer. Uh, and with this approach, so usually uh, the asset of active target, the energy loss in the gas is high, so you don't necessarily need to use a trigger. You can directly uh, each channel self filtering uh, since the energy, so amplitude uh, generated is high enough. And with this uh, transition, uh, we gain a factor of eight in two months, which translates directly in uh, less statistical uncertainties and lower cross section achievable. Uh, we so I uh, will focus now today uh, on two recent measurements. I, so for weak air process nuclei, more precisely, uh, happened at Atlas on strontium 88, so stable one here, which was the first one we did uh, electronic, and recently on the rubidium 87, stable one. So now you see why at the start we have seen these two nuclei for the reaction by direction. So with this approach, obviously, the first step is to identify uh, your entrance beam in the detector. Nothing very new here. We are going to use particle identification based on energy delta E uh, plot. So we compare the energy loss in the two first strip of the anode. So you can see here for the strontium case, clearly we see the beam and we add we knew from the ion source coming a rotation light contaminant. You can see that it's separated well. And because we have relatively high rate for active gaseous target, I mentioned 40 kilohertz, you also expect, and we see it, up to 10% pileup, which is still uh, well reasonable. And it's measured and controlled throughout the movement. Same story with rubidium, preliminary one. So as you can see here, we have also same idea comparing the energy loss in the first trip. So in this experiment, we had also a contaminant, this one also from the source at vanadium at more intensity than the rutesium, still separable. And the resolution here on the left side was slightly uh, poorer, reason why you have this kind of spread. Still, we uh, can, with comparing the energy loss in the first two strip, are able to separate and select well our view. And the pileup, same rate, was uh, measured also around 10%. Then you have two ways. The next step is obviously to select your alpha capture uh, channel. Uh, in this energy region, I want to mention that uh, two uh, reaction channels are expected to dominate the alpha N and the scattering alpha. Alpha P, alpha gamma are very low cross section expecting, meaning up to 1000 uh, less than alpha N. So we are mainly uh, comparing to identify alpha capture reaction with respect to the scattering for the uh, channel. So again, you are going to lose the, the fact that the energy loss uh, on your, in your gas are function, as you know, of the square of your uh, atomic number. So you can use a kind of global approach, meaning you looked at the energy loss average after the reaction occurrence, uh, as you can see on the vertical axis, as a function of the total energy loss on the anode path, this kind of delta E, uh, and you can see here that you have the main region from the scattering. So scattering means that your product is beam-like, so you could, we go back to actually the beam spot if we were not selecting a reaction happening in the strip three. And higher, so you can see here, less statistic, the alpha in channel, indeed, alpha in, you increase your atomic number, so you expect more energy loss. This is for the strontium 88 case. Similarly, for the rubidium, you can see here, so 
pressure energy were not exactly the same. So we had, in the case of the rubidium, more energy loss for the alpha N. At this energy, alpha 1N and alpha 2N in this case were open, but still we can see the separation of the alpha N channel versus the scattering. And you can already see that it's not normalized, but clearly they are with the rubidium 87, we have more statistics, a point I will develop later. Now you can have a local approach looking at the energy loss profile as a function of the anode, which makes kind of seem clearer to identify the alpha channel. So here for the strontium case, I show you here the uh, black curve corresponding to your own reactive beam. So with this pressure and energy, we didn't expect it. We were close to the black peak at the end of music. And as you can see, the energy loss are close to the A to uh, high at the end. When a reaction occurs, as mentioned, alpha and reaction, we increase the atomic number, we lose more energy. So this is this kind of clear jump in the energy loss for the right uh, continuous curve corresponding to alpha and channel, uh, you can see here. Scattering, as mentioned, brings you back for the recall on a beam-like recall. So this is, you can see here some example of the red dotted traces. So you have also had the reaction an increase due to the scattering, but then you follow again a strontium-like particle, so you are close to the beam. And in this experiment, I've mentioned that we had a potassium contaminant, which is higher Z than zirconium recall for the alpha N, and was also kind of useful reference to see the energy loss just above our alpha N, kind of, uh, confirmation that these red traces were indeed following a zirconium, so from alpha N reaction. This is for the strontium. Preliminary result for our rubidium experiment, and you can see it's pretty similar. So you can see the black curve for following the beam. As mentioned, the conditions were not exactly the same, and in this case, we can see the bright peak around strip 14 for our uh, beam. In this case, uh, the, I, the vanadium very far from um, an atomic number from the yttrium recall for uh, alpha N. I didn't show here, for, uh, but it's, um, it could be used also, but as mentioned, uh, lower <laughs> Z, so less uh, revenant comparison than mutation. But still, you can see the alpha N tra uh, trajectories well distinguished from the scattering for reaction happening in strip, in strip three. And again, as you can see, the statistic, it's not normalized between the two, but there is more events in um, the rubidium. Okay, the limit in with this measurement, so the first limit is obviously, as you know, when you want to measure uh, your reaction uh, deeper into music, so at lower energy in center of mass, the cross-section goes down, so you have the statistical limit. The other limit, I want to illustrate it here, it's you kind of start being the energy loss for your recall get closer to the beam and closer to the scattering lag. And you can see on the strontium that actually you start to be, so this is to the time where it's still, uh, we can still see the alpha and the scattering, but you start to understand that the scattering get close to the alpha N. And when you look at global approach, it's also the same. You can see your alpha N region getting into the scattering region. And you can see on the right, the same uh, observation for the rubidium line. So even if you have high statistic, we have this uh, on the systematic uncertainty impact at low energy from such missing. So the first step is done to identify the alpha N reaction. No, to get the cross section, it's simply because I mentioned at the beginning, you also measure the beam, so you have your intensity. This is an active target close to 100% efficiency. So quantifying the cross section is straightforward. The next step is obviously at a given strip, what is the center of mass energy for the reaction? To do this, you need to quantify the slowing down of the beam inside music entrance windows and gas. First thing you can do, you can use 
stopping power tables from reference tab, uh, uh, from references database like the stream uh, or the Altima that you can obtain from the list plus plus code. I show you here in the case of strontium 88, the equivalent uh, energy center of mass energy for the alpha ion reaction. If I use either on the horizontal axis stream stopping power or on the vertical Altima stopping power. So you clearly see a deviation that obviously increase when you go uh, deeper into music, so lower energy. Okay, this is the status. You, you can say we have this uncertainty on the uh, center of mass energy, and it's what it is. But the trick, looking at the excitation function from strontium 88, the measure one, compared to if you use either uh, uh, stream the blue point or Altima stopping power, the red point, to get your center of mass energy, you clearly see that you have a deviation up to more than 10% at low energy. And so your final uh, cross-section for this point will have very high uncertainty, which kind of, I told you at the beginning, our goal here is to drastically reduce the uh, uncertainties on our cross-section and so on our reaction rate. So this is not acceptable. Reason why, for these two, strontium-88 and rubidium-87, we measure online uh, the energy loss of our beam inside the windows and the gas. We use it for this L-silicon downstream at zero degree after music. But for such light heavy, uh, sorry, for such heavy elements, strontium rubidium, the response function of the silicon is not directly uh, the one of the alpha source. I will show you in one slide from literature data that we expected this. So we looked at first to calibrate the, uh, our silicon in energy with in-beam information. So I show you here, uh, so from uh, using, so the green point corresponds to classical alpha source at relatively low energy, uh, less than 10 MeV. And you can see the uh, black point corresponding to different beam energy from strontium 88 that are well measured by time of flight from the Atlas uh, accelerator. This is our reference point. And then you measure inside the silicon, so you can calibrate. We did the same for the rubidium, the blue point, and you see that we have a deviation between this calibration uh, curve with respect to the alpha one. And this is in this uh, pulse defect when you go to heavy ion in silicon detector. That was known, I show you results actually at lower energy, happen with uh, at argon, um, as you can see here. You start the point here corresponding to helium, so alpha source, and you clearly see the response function deviating up to when you see the heavy uh, uranium mass. And just here, our rubidium strontium were kind of in between this nickel silver point, and this is close to what we have seen recently in beam. So we use this energy in beam uh, function, and then we looked at uh, the beam energy loss in our silicon after crossing the windows and the gas, and we can measure the energy loss. So this is a preliminary result, left strontium, rubidium on the right, at the usual. So you start the point here, so you measure the energy horizontal axis on the silicon and on the vertical axis, I compare a Monte Carlo expected energy by using either the two, uh, either stream or Altima or a kind of mean. I will, uh, you can see already why uh, by uh, comparing, I use this kind of mean value for the stopping power. So the first point with the windows, I want to mention that in, we were close to. Um, in Titan, have a good agreement with Altima for the strontium and for the rubidium, actually closer to a mean between uh, SRIM and Altima. And then the game is to put, uh, slowly increase the gas pressure and again measure uh, the energy after, kind of way to increase the pass length of your uh, beam in gas and so get uh, the energy loss. And from this, you can see here that the main agreement was from the measurement was by using an average value between SRIM and ATIMA. Pointing out that the energy, equivalent energy for our alpha reaction were up to 
100 MeV. So the low energy points are actually not useful for us in this uh, cross-section measurements. So now the results. So I just wanted to start, uh, sorry, I think I went fast at the beginning, uh, to say that this alpha and reaction measurement direct cross-section for the weaker process I'm showing today was already proven feasible and successful with uh, molybdenum 100 by Regia and all. You can see here the results. So again, you can see the similar clear identification of alpha and grasses. And you can see here the cross-section. And this was also, you can see, measured by activation techniques from the actum group. And the measurements through music and this were in really good agreement. And you see here, compared with the statistical model using uh, uh, the um, what the atom key alpha optical model potential, as the name said it from the atom key group, the agreement between measure and expected cross section were really good, up to twenty percent. So I showed that we have measure for cobidium eighty seven. Sontium 88 for two different impacts at n equal 50 shell closure. I just want to measure here that coming soon, uh, another measurement was done uh, at FRIB, also on the shell closure. So Krypton 86 with a stronger astrophysical impact. And this is important because with these three measurements, we can probe on the shell closure and equal 50 and see the impact. Uh, so this is done uh, by a uh, Lauren PhD student here. Um, and you can see here from criminal identification, clearly the alpha N really looked alike uh, from this kind of measurement. So there is definitely a kind of standard process for measuring this reaction. Now for the strontium 88, I show you here uh, our uh, cross-section measured. So you can see, uh, so ex, uh, sorry, center of mass energy uh, from the measurements, and then the cross section, and as mentioned, the uncertainty. So as expected, we go at lower energy. The cross section goes down, so less cons, less statistics. This makes sense. And also, as mentioned, lower energy, you start to have the systematic uncertainty due to the. Uh, elastic, uh, sorry, scattering uh, contamination, let's say. Also, because it was the first measurement with the digital system, part of the measurement were done also on the analog system, kind of have the cross check, and the cross section measure between the two were in excellent agreement, validating both the digital acquisition system and also running at uh, high rates, more than 10 kilohertz. And now I show you here, so this measure cross-section, the rate point, as a function of the center of mass energy. This is preliminary. And you can see already that compared to the molybdenum case, if you looked the uh, so the black curve here, which is the other uh, expected cross-section for the alpha 1n um, in with the atom T. Uh, alpha optical model potential that was very successful on the molybdenum case I showed you before. And using also another uh, potential, um, you can see the green curve here, which I actually give you a very close result. You can see here that we have uh, at the bottom of the deviation, we have a, in this strontium between the measure cross section and the expected one, an important uh, deviation. Pointed out that you may ask other uh, width of other optical model potential. Actually, these two, so Abrigino and Atom Keol, remain the closest one. But still, we have here clearly an important deviation. Recently, uh, second measurement was done, and uh, work is ongoing on this, uh, so stay tuned. Second measurement I've mentioned, rubidium recently happened. So the same here. You can see the cross section, the response from the measurements up to the gamma window low energy part. I compare with the expected observation part cross section using the uh, robust atom key web. We expect robust atom key potential. And here you can see, so as I mentioned sorry, at the beginning, for this reaction, 
at for the high energy point, we have both alpha one and alpha two n open channel with music we measure the total cross section. But still comparing, you clearly see that here we have a very good agreement within 10% between our three millary measure cross section and the prediction for mother server calculation. So okay. this is you have around five minutes. Okay, I'm at the end actually. So this is perfect. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so final point, so final game for this measurement, I said, is to get the alpha uh, reaction rate. So this is preliminary in the case of the strontium, just to illustrate the idea. So we have measured our cross-section up to the high gamma energy. And the idea, using raw scaling, the expected cross-section, I've shown you uh, before in the case here, you can see the red dotted curve, you can extrapolate using this uh, cross-section to get your reaction rate over all the temperature window, and including the uncertainty here from this raw scaling between the measured and the theoretical uh, cross-section, you can see here that we have still up to 30% in the neutron and turbine wave, which is what we were aiming at the start of this experimental work. And just some word to finish, that I've shown you that alpha and were measured with, with music mainly uh, on stable ele elements. And here at the screen, and you know, uh, close by uh, with the Atlas, in particular, new caribou source, you know that in the coming, uh, we have already actually available neutron rich with high intensity beam. So the next uh, goal uh, with this technique and this air process reaction is obviously to go toward the neutron rich side and to measure alpha N. So I want to measure from uh, our collaborator present here, some already approved experiments that should happen in the coming years to measure both at Atlas and at f this alpha N on the neutron rich side with strong astrophysical impact. And clearly, you see that there are more to come, in particular, to look over an isotopic line. So strontium, as you can see, has been measured and some approved. We can also continue the work on the neutron rich side for rubidium and krypton 89, which can be the, our outlook for the next experimental work. And uh, on this, I just want to say uh, so a few words I'd shown you clearly. So the idea to measure this quick air process alpha and reaction to use active target, which is efficient and reliable. We have, uh, for the first time, measured strontium 88 and rubidium 87 with preliminary results shown today. Uh, the game, as mentioned, will be to measure, to go further, so waiting uh, to finalize uh, at the n equal 50 uh, on the, so rubidium, strontium, and krypton isotope, and to see this kind of observed discrepancy for strontium, is it an outlayer, or is it something more here, to go towards the neutron rich line to test also how our optical model potential prediction on this area, so next experiment happening in a few years, as mentioned. And I want to acknowledge finally that this is clearly not the only method, only work on this weekend process, and here in uh, North America, so you have also so local separator with SECAR or uh, EMA line at Triumph that allows you also to well measure alpha and cross section. And as mentioned, active uh, technique uh, with results from the Atom King Group. On this, I want to thank all the collaborators behind this measurement and you for the attention.